This is Jose Merino, Editor-in-Chief of the Neurology Family of Journals. The Neurology Podcast provides practical information to neurologists and other clinicians to help them provide better care for their patients. Thanks for listening and have a great week. Hello and welcome to the Neurology Podcast. I'm Jess Gailani. I'm the Director of the Georgetown Headache Center in Washington, D.C. Our topic for this podcast is updates in idiopathic intracranial hypertension or pseudotumor cerebri. IIH is a secondary headache disorder that, while uncommon, is one of the more common secondary headaches you would be seeing in your neurology clinic. Symptoms can look a lot like migraine, so watching for some cardinal features of things like vision changes and pulsatile tinnitus is really important. I'm joined by my esteemed colleague and friend, Kathleen DeGray, who's a professor emeritus of neurology at the University of Utah that is also a neuro-ophthalmologist, so super important for this field, and I'm so glad to have her talk to us about this particular topic. Kathleen, welcome. Well, thank you so much for having me. So let's start by talking about some typical symptoms that a general neurologist should be looking for in a suspected case of IIH. The most common symptom is headache. And unfortunately, there's not a specific headache that people get with this disorder. It can mimic a phenotype of any type, migraine, tension type, etc. It also has visual symptoms like transient visual obscurations and whooshing noises in the head. And neurologists need to just be aware that somebody coming in with a headache Our job is to make sure that they don't have a secondary headache. We always are looking for primary headache disorders, but our job is to rule out those secondary headaches. And so when I hear of somebody having visual changes and headache and maybe pulsatile tinnitus and things like that, I might be looking in the back of their eye to see if they could have papilledema. Good points. Watching out for those symptoms that don't really go along with migraine or tension type headache. You see that patient, they're telling you they're having some whooshing noise in the ear and sometimes walking into the wall. (laughs) Sometimes when I say loss of vision, they're like, I don't know what you're talking about. So I might ask them like, you bumping into things, sometimes like brushing against the wall that you always knew was there, anything to check for that peripheral vision loss. And you're starting to pick up some of these signs and you decide to order an MRI. That read comes back. What are some things that we might see in imaging findings with IIH? One of the most common things that gets reported is empty cella, but that is so nonspecific, you can't go by that. But I think neuroradiologists are really looking for signs of increased intracranial pressure, especially if you rule out IIH. They have a little checklist of different signs they're going to look for. Empty cella is one, least specific. But dilated nerve sheaths seen on T2 axial scans where the CSF surrounds the optic nerve, or the optic nerve is really tortuous within the orbit. They may actually report flattening of the globe. The globe should be round, but if you see a flattened globe, that can be a sign of pressure. And rarely do you ever see the optic disc papilla actually inside the globe. It would have to be pretty bad papilledema to see it like that. But one of the most sensitive signs is really narrowing of the transverse venous sinuses. However, I just want to make two points. One is you can get a report like this in somebody that you sent for, let's say, numbness of the right side. Do they have raised intracranial pressure because they've got these findings? Remember, IIH is a package diagnosis. You have to have symptoms. You have to have signs. The imaging helps you make the diagnosis, but it's not the end of the diagnosis. The second point is many studies have recently been done to validate these radiologic findings, and the most important ones really are narrowing of the transverse venous sinus, dilated distension around the CSF or tortuosity, and the empty cell. If you have three of four findings, then you might have a good case if you've got the symptoms and the signs of raised intracranial pressure to make the diagnosis. There are many different radiologic signs that could be reported, but remember, this is a package deal. You can't just make it on imaging alone. I can't tell you how often we send a patient with pretty clear signs and symptoms of migraine for a routine scan because of change in symptoms and out comes just empty cella. And now the patient is concerned about IIH. And you have to explain to him, you don't have papilledema, you have normal visual fields, you don't have the whooshing. This is really not not what we're looking at. And so I do think it's great we've had some literature that really helps us along with that and the package deal that's really important. 
So Kathleen, we have this patient, we have the suspicion of IIH, we send them for this scan and they have, let's say, three out of those four signs. Now we send them to an ophthalmologist, they pick up papilledema and loss of visual fields, the peripheral vision is getting worse. What are our treatment goals in IIH? Because a lot of times in neurology, we focus on the headache. And we think we're going to treat the headache with acetazolamide, but really there's more than one goal here that the treatment is too pronged with vision and headache. I would add third one, and that's improving visual quality of life with these people. But vision is number one and number two is headache, but three is visual quality of life, which is actually tied to the headache. Those two are correlated. The frustrating part of this disease is you wish you could do one-stop shopping, but you can't. Most neurologists do not have a visual field machine in their office. They can check a visual acuity, and they can maybe look in the back of the eye with confidence using an ophthalmoscope or a pan-optic ophthalmoscope or even taking a photo. You really need it to partner with an ophthalmologist. Of all the conditions I see that neurologists get into legal entanglements, it's with following papilledema and following visual fields. You've got to follow the field. The acuity is the last to go. The field is where it's at. So you partner with an ophthalmologist. It's a team sport taking care of somebody with IIH. But a neurologist's job is really to work on the headache portion of this And then partner with that ophthalmologist and realize that they're going to be using acetazolamide in large doses, two to four grams, in order to reduce the intracranial pressure. And if their vision starts to go, they may even recommend a surgical treatment. And we have three surgical treatments these days. We can do optic nerve sheath fenestration if there are people in your place that does those kind of procedures. Some places don't have orbital surgeons that do nerve sheath fenestrations. Neurosurgeons will often do shunting, both ventricular peritoneal and lumbar peritoneal shunting. And the third one that I'm seeing a lot more of is stenting the venous sinuses, and it can either be done by an interventional neuroradiologist or a neurosurgeon. But those are the three things that if the vision starts to go despite medical therapy, that's what they're going to do. But do those treatments help the headache? No. No. <laughs> That's sometimes what you see people getting these procedures for is... No. Yes. Stenting for headache or shunting for headache. And you're like, no, no, no. <laughs> Here's the deal. In six months, 70% of these people still have headaches and they're hard to treat. And then you do stenting and in a nice systematic review... Mark Dinkin found that was the most difficult part to treat. And even with stenting, the headaches didn't get completely better either. So you can't use these procedures as a headache treatment. Our job is, number one, to protect the patient from going for these invasive procedures that have side effects. And then we have to treat the headache. And it is hard. Treating headaches with IIH is hard because there's two parts of the headache. First, you have the acute raised intracranial pressure part of the headache. That's a new headache for somebody and they're going to blame it on their pressure. Okay. And then you can treat them, let's say with acetazolamide, bring their pressure down, their papilledema gets better. But guess what? Sometimes the headache doesn't get better. In fact, I would say the majority of these patients, I'm following the headache, even though their papilledema is completely gone, their pressure is completely controlled. And I find this to be the most difficult part of treating the headache with IIH. I often find that the lingering headache, I call it more of a migraine, not necessarily because of all the features, though they tend to have that, but it's just a central activation that occurs from having their pressure is high in the beginning, the brain becomes oversensitized, it's angry like you're having chronic migraine, and then even if the pressure goes down and the visual fields get better and the vision improves, the brain is still really mad. It's just like any other new onset headache disorder where the switch was turned on and it becomes hard to switch it off. Remember, Jessica, in the IIHTT, 40 to 50% of these individuals had underlying migraine or probable migraine. So 
it, like they pre-morbidly had migraine in addition. So it's like you get a double whammy for most of our patients. It's an important point to establish that they had pre-morbid migraine as well, because it may tell you something about the disease. And I do think that there are some glimmers of hope. People are trying to study headache with IIH. And for example, there have been reports in the literature about using some of our newer medications like CGRP monoclonal antibodies to treat it because often the phenotype is chronic migraine. And some people have tried onobotulinum toxin. And that's where the neurologist can be the shero or the hero to actually make our patients better. We've got things in our toolbox and we know how to use them. And I really think this is going to be an important piece for neurologists to embrace the treatment of the headache disorder that comes with IIH. So we briefly, we've talked a bit about paying attention to the vision, working with the ophthalmologist, acetazolamide to lower pressure if there's visual field issues, and also just, I think, for that introductory period when the pressure is high and it's initially causing some symptoms besides headache that occurs in IIH. And we've also talked about procedures if there's visual field and visual acuity issues. We've talked about using some of the newer treatment options and onobotulinum toxin to treat headache. What about weight loss? I'm just going to go right there. There have been some really great studies over the last few years looking at weight loss and its impact on vision and vision quality of life. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? This is critical. That's one of the legs on the stool that we have to tell our patients. And the ophthalmologist should be saying the same thing, but could the neurologist enforce that weight loss brings remission? And this has been shown now in several studies, even from the early 70s, there was a rice diet that people got put on, taking almost no calories in and losing tremendous amount of weight and their papilledema went away. And then Birmingham group did a great study where they put people on a very low calorie diet, low energy diet, and they lost their papilledema and things got better. And then they found out that if you do gastric bypass surgery and lose a portion of your weight, even 10% of your weight, the papilledema can get better and go away. The newest kid on the block are the GLP-1s. This GLP-1 agonist glucagon-like peptide is secreted in our hypothalamus and it's supposed to signal satiety. And these agonists have been now used in for weight loss and diabetes. And now we're finding all kinds of other conditions that it seems to be helping. One study just did a small group of women where they put a sensor in the brain to actually follow the pressure, and half of them got put on a GLP-1 agonist, and they could see that the pressure dropped, which was wonderful, and it stayed dropped for a period of time. And then there's an open label studies that have also shown this. And recently in JAMA Neurology, there was an article that went through a big database, a Trinex database, where it showed that there was reduced papilledema in those who took the GLP-1, reduced headache, fewer medications, and here's an interesting fact, reduced mortality. Now, we never thought that IIH was a mortal disease, but it turns out that a study done in our journal, Neurology, by Hermes in 2020, showed that people's life expectancy is cut short with a diagnosis of IIH. And we recently did a study that we presented at the North American Neuroophthalmology Society, where the mean age of death was 46 years. And an interesting and important piece of this was there was increase in self-harm. And that also was in the Hermes study. So our study didn't find anything that the Hermes study didn't find, but we are saying, yep, that's true. Mortality is increased in self-harm, probably because of the risk of the depression, anxiety that can go along with this disorder. And so weight loss becomes really important for every neurologist to recommend because we can get remission of the disease. And we need to be screening for depression and anxiety because those are treatable conditions. And if they are depressed by one of the screening tools that are out there, we should be treating those people. Yeah, these are all great points. And I also just want to say when we recommend weight loss, we do have to be very sensitive about it is not easy. One of the big studies in the last few years, which was looking at gastric bypass, was showing how it was near impossible to achieve those results they achieved with bypass by diet alone. And so if we just tell our patients to eat less, exercise more, I don't think that's going to help them. 
I really think this is a disease that requires weight loss specialists to get involved. And that's a point. Every neurologist should look at IIH as Rigmor Janssen says, it's a team sport. It's the ophthalmologist, it's a weight loss specialist, it's a neurologist, it may be a neurosurgeon, it may be an orbital surgeon, but you have to get a team around this to work on making our patients better. Because we neurologists are not weight loss specialists. We can say, we know weight loss makes us better, but losing weight is extremely difficult. And we should emphasize that. And that's why we're going to send you to professional clinic that deals with weight loss. And more and more weight loss clinics are using the GLP-1 agonist. And now we know it can reduce intracranial pressure all by itself, reduce that papilledema, and even help with mortality, which in that big database was surprising that it actually found that finding. And I think that's a really interesting piece of the puzzle. I do want to make the point also that because these women are obese and many have diabetes and polycystic ovarian disease and so on, this is a metabolic vascular disease too. And we have to warn them that they're a little bit higher risk for cardiovascular events and that they really need to work with their primary care for primary prevention. And secondly, in pregnancy, women who have IIH often have higher rates of preeclampsia and eclampsia. So we really need to work on that piece too. We have to be advocates for these patients because it's a very difficult disease to manage. Kathleen, you just made me excited to go back to work tomorrow. (laughs) I feel like often this patient population, because they have so many other comorbid issues, can get very easily ignored or passed along. And there is a lot we can do And I think empowering our general neurologists and neurologists out there to realize there is a lot we can do. And we shouldn't just feel like, oh, acetazolamide and surgery is it. Actually, that's not even our portion. We've got the fun stuff. We do the counseling. We've got new anti-migraine drugs that might work for this. We've got onobotulinum toxin in our hands. And then we can make up the team and really encourage and cheerlead our patients to walk them through that path of improvement. And that's actually really important for us to remember. Thank you so much, Kathleen, for all your amazing insights. And I did, I told you, I always learn when we talk to each other and I definitely have learned a couple of more points today. Thank you for having me. This is Stacey Clardy, your podcast editor. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please take a few moments to subscribe, rate, and review the Neurology Podcast through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. And remember, you can always head to neurology.org backslash podcast for our full list of past episodes, or you can also search by keyword in your podcast app for any neurology-specific topics you want to learn about.